Do you find yourself bored at work while eating your lunch? Do you watch the clock waiting for work to be over? As you're sitting in meetings, do you find your boss's voice sounding like a howling banshee? Then don't wait another minute. Tune in to the Paranormal Peeps podcast. We are ready to entertain you. Darkcast Network. Out of the shadows come the best of any podcasts. I'm sorry, and you're listening to Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ. Hey, my language can be strong, like the rock. Listen with discretion. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. We are entering into part two of the Smiley Face Killer series that I wanted to cover. Last episode, we were in Pennsylvania, so this episode, we're going to move into some other states. And we're going to look into some eerily similar cases where young college-aged men vanish quickly while they're out drinking with friends. And then they reappear deceased, allegedly drowned in a body of water. If you haven't listened to part one, you might want to go back and do so to be on track with this episode. So a quick recap. The Smiley Face Killers is a theory. It's based upon the investigations of a couple retired New York City detectives and a criminal justice professor. I call this group of professionals the SFK team, which stands for Smiley Face Killers Team. It consists of retired detectives Kevin Gannon, who last episode I accidentally called Keith Gannon, and Anthony Duarte, as well as Dr. Lee Gilbertson. And they've been under the belief since 2008 that there isn't just one killer out there taking the lives of these young men, but rather domestic terrorist cells that are responsible for many of these hundreds of deaths, even though they marked the start of the killings in 1997. The SFK team feel that these hundreds of deaths with all the victims being college age, having a good education, being athletic, either working their dream job or working towards it, and being out the night they disappear at a bar drinking with friends, and then they end up days, weeks, months, and a body of water is no coincidence. Nor are most of the deaths accidental drownings like law enforcement and coroners have declared. Also in a number of the cases, a graffitied smiley face has been found near where many of the victims are pulled from the water. Thus the moniker, the Smiley Face Killers. While you and I most likely won't solve these cases, it is important to shed light on the possibility that these victims are victims of homicides. The SFK team's existence is to try and prove their theory and hopefully get some, if not all, of the cases reopened by law enforcement agencies. In last episode, I told you over 300 young men were suspected victims of the Smiley Face Killers. That number was from 2017. I found an update as of 2023, and the SFK team now believe that that number is closer to 680-plus possible victims, which means in six or seven years, the numbers have more than doubled. And even currently, there's a string of young and youngish men drowning in Austin, Texas at Lady Bird Lake. There's been mention of these deaths possibly being perpetrated by a smiley face killer cell. So this episode, we're starting off in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The year was 2002. The victim was 21-year-old Christopher Jenkins, who went by Chris. He was good-looking, a swimmer a runner, a bicyclist. He was attending the University of Minnesota as a senior business major, whose grade point level was very high. Chris was all about his friends, though, and making them laugh. They loved his sense of humor. Chris loved music and dancing, and while he was a business major, he wanted to start law school upon graduation. His hopes and dreams were to become a lawyer, do some traveling, get married, and start a family. 
He was out with friends at a bar in Minneapolis on Halloween night. When he left or was possibly kicked out of the bar around midnight, he vanished while wearing his Halloween costume. His Halloween costume, which would probably be considered in poor taste today, was that of a Native American. Four months later, Chris's body, still clad in his Halloween costume, would reappear floating in the Mississippi River on his back. His arms were neatly folded across his chest, almost as if he had been positioned that way. And for being in a turbulent body of water to be found in that position, it's odd to say the least. Months later, a jailhouse snitch who was incarcerated on unrelated charges came forward and claimed that Chris was thrown from a bridge into the river. Law enforcement was never quite sure if this was just a ploy from the convict serving time to lower his sentence or if this information was actually real. However, the information they were given reopened Chris's case four years after his case was closed as an accidental drowning. While Chris's case might be open, nothing more has come from it. Rest in power, Chris. A 22-year-old missing persons case from Stearns County, Minnesota, has some people wondering if 20-year-old Joshua Geeman could have fallen victim to the Smiley Face Killers. He fit the criteria. He was young, handsome, athletic build, and he was intelligent. On November 9, 2002, Josh left a small party where he and some campus friends were playing poker. Around midnight, he was walking home through the campus to get to his dormitory room. But as far as anyone can tell, Josh never made it back to his room at all. Law enforcement found about 28 pictures of men on Josh's computer. They theorized that Josh might have been exploring his sexual identity. That's just one of the theories that they had, that maybe Josh left the party early to go hook up with one of the men in the pictures. They even posted the pictures of all the men that Josh had pictures of to see if anyone in the public could help identify any of them. There's no word if anyone came forward from that particular post. Another theory was that Josh had drowned in a lake on campus walking home, but there was no body ever discovered in that lake. I guess Josh's case and the photos of the men were also released on the show Unsolved Mysteries. And after that, quite a few tips came in about some of the men. But investigators were never able to get a solid lead on what happened to Josh. To this day, Josh remains missing. Victim of the smiley face killers or of something else, we just don't know. Josh is presumed dead. But with that presumption, I just don't feel right wishing him to rest in power. I would rather hope he resurfaces alive someday instead. Now we're going to head to Wisconsin and work around that way until we get back east. 21-year-old Lucas Homan went by Luke. He was attending and a senior at University of Wisconsin in La Crosse. That would be in 2006. His parents were pretty worried from the start of his college career, as they knew seven young men had disappeared in the past and they were found drowned in the nearby Mississippi River. Luke's mom especially would say, stay away from the water, almost every time when she had a chance to talk to Luke. And Luke, he would just laugh and assure her he hadn't even seen the water since he'd been there, and all the activities he participated in had nothing to do with being near the river. Besides that, Luke didn't really like water locations so he was not the kind of guy that would purposely head out for a day at the river, the lake, or the beach. In late September of 2006, Luke did go to some bars to celebrate Oktoberfest with a few of his friends and teammates. Luke was on the university's basketball team, and in high school he'd been a star athlete playing both basketball, and he was the quarterback of his football team. The night Luke went out with his buddies to a bar, he had a good buzz on, but he wasn't totally wasted. He was coherent in his speech and he could walk just fine. His friend's plans for the night was to go bar hopping. You know, have a drink or two at one bar and then head on to the next. After the first bar, his buddies were ready to go. 
but they didn't see Luke, so they left anyway to the next bar. But Luke was still at the first bar, and it didn't deter him when his friends left. He found another friend that he knew at the bar. This was a 19-year-old kid named Austin Scott. Oh, the world of fake IDs. Anyway, Luke hung out at the first bar with Austin until around 12.30 a.m. This is all according to Austin, by the way. Austin also said that Luke had a verbal altercation with three men at the bar, and then he decided to just leave. Okay, so it's 12.30 a.m. Luke is probably a little drunk and a little heated if he was in an altercation, and then he left the bar alone. Austin said the three men left too, but then they came back about 20 minutes later, and then they started a fight with Austin, even breaking a beer bottle over Austin's head. Bleeding, Austin also decided it was time for him to go home. The following day, Luke was nowhere to be found. He was supposed to be at a golf tournament, but he didn't show up for it. His original friends that he went to that first bar with, they were starting to get worried about him. And around 9 p.m., one of them went to the police station to file a missing persons report on Luke. Police interviewed the friends Luke was seen with at the bar, as well as Luke's roommate. And while his friends were being spoken to by the police, Austin was running his mouth to other college students about the altercation Luke had been in with three mysterious men. When fact-checking, police did find out, yes, there was indeed an altercation the night Luke vanished. But it happened out in the alleyway between a band member who was playing at the bar that night. He was out in the alley loading his equipment into his van. And there was a drunken dude out there who was pissing on a wall, and he got some urine on the band member's amplifier. Surveillance cameras show that the man pissing on the wall was not Luke. Austin gave the same story to the police about the fight with the three men at the bar, how they followed Luke out when Luke left, and how the three men came back into the bar and hit him over the head with a bottle of beer. But when police learned the truth, Austin was arrested for hindering a police investigation, in which he had to spend 48 hours in jail for. It also didn't help that Austin's story kept changing, and the police found out that the bar didn't even sell beer in glass bottles the night in question, but rather in plastic cups. The cops knew Austin was a liar. His story changed like three times. However, Austin has never been a suspect in Luke's disappearance or death. It just seems as though Austin was starved for attention, and he would say anything to make himself sound exciting. Three days after Luke went missing, search dogs had tracked a scent to Riverside Park next to the Mississippi River in downtown La Crosse. Divers searched the water, and they found Luke's body close to the shore. It was about ten feet from the surface, and there was a spray-painted smiley face near where Luke's body was discovered. Of course, the autopsy report for Luke came back as accidental drowning due to intoxication. I don't know about you warriors, but I'm really having doubts about many of these cases being accidental. And what is with the shady friends? In the first episode, Paul Kachu had lying roommates. And in this episode, Luke had a lying friend in Austin Scott. Rest in power, Luke. While we're still here in La Crosse, Wisconsin, last episode I told you that there was a survivor. His name is Colin Fortney. At the time, he was 21 years old and checked all the boxes of fitting into the smiley face killer scheme. Colin was also out drinking with a friend in La Crosse. This was the night of January 8, 2006, nine months before Luke Homan was out drinking with his friends and disappeared. Colin somehow was separated from his friends at the bars. And as I said last episode, Colin doesn't really remember much. He doesn't remember walking to the river or falling in. He does remember swimming against a cold current and finding a slab of concrete that was anchored to the side of the river. He grasped onto it, and he warily pulled himself up on it, 
He laid there until he had the strength to walk himself to a nearby hospital. At the hospital, Colin walked in wet, muddy, and shoeless. He was treated for some superficial wounds, and he had a toxicology test taken. His report came back with only alcohol in his system, no drugs. Was Colin's near-death incident at the hands of the smiley face killers, or was his situation one of a drunk young man who was too drunk to remember his night? and just not cognitively aware of what he was doing, until the cold water of the Mississippi sobered him up. To this day, we just don't know. Another Lacrosse, Wisconsin case, and there are several others that I'm not covering, but this one took place in 1998, when 19-year-old Nathan Kapfer had just finished DJing a local party, and then he headed to a pub with some of his friends. Nate's friends described him as being a very level-headed guy who got pretty good grades. They also said when he drank, he was never belligerent or wild and crazy drunk. But the night of February 22, 1998, the bartender at the pub refused to serve Nate anymore because he seemed overly intoxicated. This agitated Nate, and the police were called to deal with him. But instead of putting Nate in the drunk tank overnight after he registered a 0.077 blood alcohol, because it's just under the legal limit, the police released him around 2 a.m., and they gave him four citations for being drunk and disorderly in public. Not long after police released Nate, his belongings, a hat, a wallet, and the four police citations were neatly sitting next to a statue of an indigenous man in Riverside Park, but Nate was nowhere to be seen. Nate's body would reappear 42 days later in late April on the Mississippi River in La Crosse. It now had a blood alcohol level of 0.22. Now, while his autopsy report said he had no injuries or trauma, he did have a mastoid petrous ridge hemorrhage. This is an injury to his temporal lobe located in his brain, and it could have been caused and probably was caused from blunt force trauma to his head. With his alcohol level being so much higher than it was when police initially gave him the citations 42 days earlier, they believed he must have found somebody else to drink with in the park after they released him. But as we know from the first episode of The Smiley Face Killers, being in water for a long period of time, or even the warmer water due to the warmer weather could have raised his blood alcohol level. Nevertheless, I do wonder, since it would seem according to Nate's friends that he was acting a little more boisterous than he normally did after drinking, could Nate have been drugged? I think there's a good possibility he was. Rest in power, Nate. Let's head over to the Illinois and Indiana area with the case of 21-year-old Brian Wellsian. Brian had been described as easygoing, athletic. He was a finance student. And Brian was actually in Chicago, Illinois on New Year's Eve 1999, ringing in the new year of 2000, or Y2K, which turned out to be a silly hoax in itself. Brian and a couple of his friends went to a bar. But Brian had only had a couple of drinks before he became violently ill and he started to throw up. He told his friends he wanted to call it a night and go back to the hotel that they were staying at. He and his friends got in the car and began driving back to the hotel. Once near to the hotel, Brian had to have the car stop and get out because he started to throw up again. His friends took this opportunity to go park the car in the hotel parking lot and then one of them would come back and get Brian. But they never saw Brian again. Thirty miles away from Chicago, Illinois, sits a Lake Michigan beach in Gary, Indiana. Seventy-seven days later, Brian's body washed ashore Lake Street Beach in Gary. It was discovered on March 17, 2000. Police say that Brian most likely walked five minutes from his hotel to another Lake Michigan outlet in Chicago, and he just fell in. Police also said there were no signs of foul play. 
But, of course, they've said that pretty much for all the cases because they don't bother to investigate them further. They immediately closed Brian's case as an accidental drowning. The SFK team has been fighting to reopen Brian's case as a homicide, and I see why, too. He fits the criteria of many of the other victims. Plus, Brian was throwing up. It's hard to believe anyone that ill would want to take a brisk walk in under 30-degree weather in Chicago if they've been violently throwing up. A forensic pathologist believes Brian was dead before he was ever placed in the water. And after presumably floating in a lake for two and a half months, his autopsy reported only slight to moderate decomposition, no real discoloration or skin slippage. It almost seems as though he were abducted, kept for a while, killed, and then placed in the water. Otherwise, there definitely would have been more decomposition. Even in the frigid waters of January, the water would have been warmer in April as the weather in Gary, Indiana in April was in the mid-70s. And the warmer weather would have caused more, well, rot to a body. There was also zero water found in Brian's lungs and chest cavity by the medical examiner. No water in his lungs. But yet he was classified as drowning accidentally. And one last thing about his autopsy report, there was lividity to his posterior, which means when someone dies, their blood pools downwards, and it causes the skin to take on a purplish hue. Brian would have had to have floated the entire 77 days on his back for this to have happened. The chances of that are slim to none, especially since I understand Lake Michigan waters can be rather rough. Rest in power, Brian. December 17, 2022. A fairly recent date, actually. 25-year-old student of medicine Peter Salvino would disappear. Peter was in the process of becoming a doctor. He was out at a party that night, and he left the party around midnight, or maybe a little bit after. Even though Peter had had a few drinks, his friends at the party said that he seemed fine definitely coherent enough to walk home. About 12.15 a.m., Peter was on a FaceTime call with a friend. He told his friend he was walking home to his apartment. At 12.31 a.m., Peter's phone pinged at Diversity Harbor. This was blocks past where Peter's apartment was. At 12.37 a.m., Peter's friend called him back, but Peter didn't pick up. The call went unanswered. Other friends had tried to call Peter up until 9.30 a.m. later that morning. By 9.45, all calls went to voicemail and texts went undelivered. Four days later, on December 21st, around 6 p.m., Peter's body was discovered floating in Diversity Bay. This is part of Lake Michigan in Chicago, Illinois. It's the last place Peter's phone had pinged from. Peter's death was ruled... You guessed it, accidental drowning. His toxicology report came back as having ethanol in his system. Ethanol is a natural gas made by plant fermentation. When people get sick or die from alcohol poisoning, it's usually from ethanol. But it would seem that Peter's body had also been in the water for a few days, and that could have accounted for some of the rise in the blood alcohol level. Because as stated by his friends earlier, the ones that were at the party with him, Peter seemed fine and not wasted at all. Peter is suspected to possibly have been a smiley face killer cell victim. Rest in power, Peter. There have been quite a few college-age men drownings in the Chicago vicinity that many people have attributed to possibly being the work of the smiley face killers such as 26-year-old Noah Enos. He'd been attending a concert the night he disappeared. He somehow got separated from his co-worker that he went to the concert with. Noah was found deceased floating in the Chicago River about a week later in early June of 2023. His death was declared an undetermined drowning. But his family doesn't subscribe to that belief. They think Noah was murdered 
and they've hired a private investigator to look into his death. Rest in power, Noah. 21-year-old Christoph Schubert was a businessman who was visiting Chicago. He came all the way over here from his home country of Poland. He was last seen alive December 3, 2022. His body was pulled from Lake Michigan four days later on December 7. His death was ruled as an accidental drowning due to ethanol intoxication. Because, of course it was. Rest in power, Christoph. June 25, 2005. 22-year-old Todd Geib went to a keg party in an orchard in Muskogan, Michigan. There were about 50 other party guests there. Around 12.45 a.m., he phoned a friend who had dropped him off. He told the friend that he was done and he was just going to walk home. At 12.51, he called that friend back and all he said was, I'm in a field, and then he hung up. Over the next few minutes, the friend tried to call Todd back. The first time, she got what sounded to her like either breathing or the wind. The next time, there was no answer. Todd's phone was not used again after 12.57 a.m. The following day, when Todd didn't show up at home, a search party went out to the orchard and they looked for Todd. This was done for three days in a row, but the searchers found nothing. During at least one of the searches, aircraft was used and there were at least 1,500 searchers, but still nothing of Todd. Twenty-two days later, a couple went to Overhaul Lake, which is a remote lake that was somewhat near the orchard that the party was at. They found a deceased Todd standing in the lake not floating, but standing up in the water. Which, if you think about it, this would be a really scary thing to find. Todd's autopsy was labeled undetermined death, but the cause of death was called an accidental drowning. For being summer, there was very little decomposition of the body. He had zero fluid in his lungs. But his toxicology report came back as having antidepressant drugs, 500 nanograms or 5 grams of the stuff in his system. Todd wasn't on antidepressant drugs, as he was never diagnosed with depression. The drug was something that could easily be crushed and stirred into someone's drink without being detected. The medical examiner determined Todd had been dead two to five days before being put in the water, which makes me wonder why the hell would the medical examiner say it was a undetermined drowning? That's so stupid. And where was Todd the three weeks before his body was found? There was a smiley face painted on a tree near where his body was discovered. And later... Someone put a smiley face sticker on his grave marker. That's so fucked up. His case remains unsolved, and it's been closed by Michigan State Police. They say it was an accidental drowning, so they have no reason to look into it further. Except for the boy had no water in his lungs, you idiot. I bet if he was a kid of law enforcement, they would have never closed the case until they had some answers. Rest in power, Todd. In Columbus, Ohio, there'll be two cases I'd like to talk about. The first will be that of 26-year-old Joey Labute Jr. He had graduated from Ohio State University at the age of 21 years old, and he had since been working for the financial firm of Morgan Stanley. Joey was pretty much a homebody, but on Friday, March 5, 2016, he decided to make an exception and go out with his cousin and her husband for a night out on the town. They went to the Union Cafe, which is touted an LGBTQ club. Sometime later that night in the crowded bar, Joey lost sight of his cousin and she lost sight of him. So she did what most of us would do and texted him several times. All of her texts went unanswered. She didn't think too much of it at the time. After all, Joey met her and her husband at the bar. He drove there himself. He was a grown man. Surely he could find his way back home. Saturday came and went, 
and so did Sunday, but Joey was still nowhere to be found. His family filed a missing persons report on him. Surveillance video inside the club around midnight shows Joey on the dance floor. Then Joey goes and uses the restroom. When he comes out, he disappears about seven minutes later. Surveillance video outside the club shows Joey leaving the club around 12.30 a.m., and that was the last time Joey was seen alive. His family searched for his car on Sunday, and they found it near the club where he had parked on Friday night. At first, Joey's family was fearful that a hate crime might have happened to Joey because of his sexual identity. They tirelessly handed out missing flyers and gave interviews to media trying to find him. Weeks later, on March 31st, Joey's body was found in the Scioto River, an area that had already been repeatedly searched for him. There was alcohol in his system, but no drugs. There was also no water in his lungs. His death was labeled an undetermined drowning. But surprisingly, it was also classified as a homicide. Rest in power, Joey. If Joey's disappearance in Columbus sounds remotely familiar to another one in Columbus, you might be thinking of 27-year-old Ohio State medical student Brian Schaefer. Brian went out with friends on March 31, 2006, and he just disappeared. Brian's case, who last episode I said I would mention this episode, was 10 years prior to Joey disappearing. Brian, a handsome athletic doctoral student, had a long day that Friday, and he was tired. But against his better judgment, he decided to go out with his roommate and his friend, Clint. Clint invited him out to go bar hopping. It was now the beginning of spring break from school, and he thought it might be fun to celebrate and unwind from his week. The ugly Tuna Saluna in Columbus was their last stop after another friend joined them. As security footage outside the ugly Tuna confirmed, all three of them rode the escalator to the bar's second-story entrance at 1.15 a.m. For some reason, Brian reemerged outside before 2 a.m., and he was seen chatting easily with two women in their 20s before he vanished. And this confuses me, honestly. Unless the bar had an outside area for its patrons to enjoy, and that's the camera outside that's being referred to, because there is no video footage of Brian leaving through the front door of the establishment. And that's why I'm confused. So, here are the speculations that go with this case. Brian is either stuck in the walls of the bar that has since been closed down, which many Reddit users seem to believe, or he left through the back door, which also was an entrance to a construction site behind the bar. The construction site was very chaotic, and it seemed like a very dangerous place for someone in the middle of the night to be. It's possible Brian did go out the back, carefully made it clear of the construction, and he ran away to live a life elsewhere. Or someone or someone's abducted him, held him, still have him, or they murdered him and dumped him in a waterway, or somewhere where his body has never been found. There are lots of possibilities here, although being a victim of the smiley face killers really makes the most sense to me. Brian, yes, had recently lost his mom to cancer. But that spring break, he was planning to propose to his girlfriend, according to his friends. So he was making plans for his future. I don't think he ran away. And I don't think he took his own life. But there is one really odd thing to me about Brian's roommate, Clint. Clint refused to take a polygraph test. Polygraphs are pretty much shit, but declining one really makes you look guilty, even if you aren't. In 2020, a believer that Brian had just ran away from his life sent a photo of a homeless man in Tijuana, Mexico, to the FBI. Now, while the picture looked uncannily similar to Brian, the FBI ran facial recognition tests, and they said it was not Brian. I sure do hope the mystery of missing Brian Schaefer will someday be exposed and no longer baffle those of us who know the case and I hope that they'll recover Brian alive. That would be amazing. 
Okay, I have just two more cases for you on the East Coast. Even though I could probably do a whole freaking season on the smiley face killers. Lord knows there have been enough victims of these suspected domestic terrorist cells. But I don't know if you're as obsessed with the theory as I am. So I figured I'd better hold it to two episodes, even if this one is a little bit longer than my normal episodes. 24 year old Will Hurley was not out at a bar or a nightclub when he vanished. Will was at a Boston Brewers hockey game in Boston, Massachusetts on October 14, 2009. At halftime, Will left the stadium to a quieter spot to call his fiancée. He asked her for a ride home as the game was half over. It's assumed Will went back to watch the rest of the hockey match. When his fiancée arrived at the stadium to pick Will up, he was not at the spot he was supposed to meet her at. Six days later, Will's body was pulled from the Charles River, located somewhat near the stadium. He had a very low blood alcohol level, but GHB, the date rape drug, was found in his system. His death was ruled an undetermined drowning. But parking lot surveillance shows Will stumbling, and he was struggling to even stand up and maintain his balance. He also had blunt force injury to his head, an eye socket, and the back of his left leg. If Will had troubles getting his balance, there's no way in hell this guy could have walked the length of the stadium parking lot to the river and then fell in, which was the cop's guess. It suspected Will's a victim of the smiley face killers. Rest in power, Will. The final victim I wanted to present to you is actually the first suspected smiley face killer's victim. He's the case that the SFK team's Kevin Gannon was assigned to when he was a detective for the New York Police Department. Even when Kevin Gannon retired, he vowed to the victim's parents that he would find the parties responsible for their son's death. 21-year-old Patrick McNeil Jr. was once called Victim Zero by law enforcement. He attended Fordham University in New York. And while there are conflicting stories of when Pat was last seen alive, some say he was only a little drunk, and some say he was a lot drunk. But what's not been disputed is that he was out with friends on February 16, 1997 drinking at a bar in Manhattan called the Dapper Dog. The Dapper Dog was a small dive bar in which college kids would frequent on evenings and on weekends. It had a fraternity-type atmosphere, and that was the big draw to it. Another attraction to the bar was that the people who ran it would appoint a popular college student to be a guest bartender some nights. The bar's hopes were that by appointing a student, it would draw in more students to come in and support their friend tending bar, and it would loosen their wallets. The student being honored as guest bartender was someone that Pat knew, someone he shared a living space with along with six or seven other guys. Pat and the guy didn't really like each other, but still Pat thought he would show up and give his support to the guy. Apparently, there were several that lived with Pat that didn't really like him. They thought he was a womanizer and that he spent far too much time in front of the mirror, preening his looks. Before closing time of the Dapper Dog, Pat bid his friends a good night and he told them he was headed to the subway to catch a train back to their home in the Bronx. He waited out front of the bar for a while. Supposedly, he was waiting for a female friend who was in the bathroom and then she was saying her goodbyes. But when the girl didn't show up after a while, Pat got tired of waiting, and he walked off down the street. He is seen on video surveillance for two blocks, and then he turned the corner and vanished. Witnesses came forward later saying they saw him attempting to walk down the street, but he would stagger, fall, then get back up and stagger some more, fall some more, get back up and repeat. Those witnesses also saw an occupied car that was double parked in front of the bar. The people in the car were watching Pat, and when Pat started to walk away from the bar, the car would follow Pat, and then it would stop when Pat fell, 
and then follow him again every time he tried to walk. Only a partial plate was able to be given for this car. Days and weeks went by and Pat never materialized, causing many searches of the area that just came up empty. Finally, months later, on April 7, 1997, Pat's badly decomposed body, only dressed in socks and blue jeans, was found floating in the waters of the East River off a pier in Brooklyn. The medical examiner quickly determined that Pat's death was a homicide and that he'd only been floating in the East River a day or two. There was housefly larva found in his groin, and the examiners were adamant that the larva was from an indoor, not an outdoor fly. To me, those pesky little fuckers all look alike. I didn't realize there were indoor and outdoor flies. Pat had rope burns around his neck, and the lividity of his body had shown that he died face down. That's where the purplish color from his blood pooling was, which was another determination that he wasn't in the water long because he was found floating on his back. Detectives believe Pat was drugged, stalked, abducted, held, tortured, and murdered, then disposed of in a body of water. Rest in power, Pat. Now for the question, why would the killer or killers put the bodies in water? Here's what the SFK team had to say about that. The effect of water on evidence makes for an almost perfect crime. Not only does it make it appear like an accidental drowning instead of a murder, but the water frequently washes away key pieces of evidence, such as fingerprints and fibers, so the killer can't be identified. You know, warriors, that actually makes a lot of sense. I also wouldn't doubt if in most of the cases the victims were drugged, and that's why some of their behavior might have seemed erratic, getting them tossed from bars and clubs. There are certain drugs and poisons that toxicology reports can't pick up. And from what I understand, GHB, the date rape drug, and prohypanol, they're colorless, odorless, and tasteless. So it'd be super easy to slip into a victim's drink when they weren't looking. My question to you guys, do you believe in the smiley face killers? I saw a person comment on a thread who believes the young men are victims of a former police officer, someone who's been jealous their whole lives of young, athletic men from wealthy families, and that this former police officer is in their early 40s now and they're a big person, most likely a man traveling to different areas between the Midwest and the East Coast. This former cop might be enlisting other men who are security officers, campus police, etc. to help him out. I kind of think that theory is bullshit, especially since this person is just grasping at straws and has nothing to back his story up. But as for the smiley face killers, I'm kind of inclined to side with the SFK team that yes, there very well could be cells of domestic terrorists out there doing this to young men. I'm not so sure there's thousands of people, and that the cell clusters consist of 10 to 18 people per cell, but I do kind of believe this theory. I mean, look, we have all these white supremacist groups out there doing horrible things to people, horrible things to the LGBTQ and a lot of them do it quietly. And to be honest with you, I'm not 100% sold on the smiley face insignia being an indicator left by the cells. If the smiley face graffiti were the insignia of the killers, I think that there would be one painted at nearly every location site that a victim was found, and not just sporadically. But I do believe many of these young men were targets for someone, or a group of someone's and that these drownings of upwards of 680 young men since 1997 are not coincidental. Apparently something similar is happening like this in the UK, and the killer's moniker is the Manchester Pusher. But all in all, I would love for you to weigh in on what you think about the smiley face killers, warriors. I love you. You matter. Remember, it is not a crime to be gay. It's not a crime to live your truth. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>